self-motivation. And really, it's the only kind of motivation there is, self-motivation. I was on a lecture tour in Australia not long ago, and the press interviewed me, and they asked me, Mr. Rohn, are you one of those American motivators? I said, no, I'm a businessman. I can share my ideas and my experiences, but people have to motivate themselves. Hey, I found out you can't change people. They can change themselves, but you can't change them. Lord knows I've tried. I had a super group of salespeople back in those early days, and I said, I'm going to make them successful if it kills me. Guess what? I almost died. You can't do that. In management, we learn good people are found, not changed. If you want good people, you have to find them. That's the best answer I can give you. If you want motivated people, you have to find them, not motivate them. The first rule of management is don't send your ducks to Eagle School. Why? Because it won't work. I've tried it all. I picked up a magazine not long ago in New York, which had a full page ad in it for a hotel chain. The first line of the ad read, we do not teach our people to be nice. Now that got my attention. And the second line said, we simply hire nice people. I thought, what a clever shortcut. Motivation is a mystery. Why some people are and some are not. Why does one person in sales see his first prospect at seven in the morning and the other salesperson sees his first prospect at 11 in the morning? Why would one start at seven and the other start at 11? I don't know. I call it mysteries of the mind. I give a lecture to a thousand people. One walks out and says, I'm going to change my life. Someone else walks out with a yawn and says, I've heard all this stuff before. Why is that? Why aren't they both affected the same? I don't know. I call it mysteries of the mind. A wealthy man says to a thousand people, I read this book and it started me on the road to wealth. Guess how many people of the thousand go out and get the book? Answer, very few. Isn't that incredible? Why wouldn't everyone go get the book? It's called Mysteries of the Mind. To one person you say, you better slow down. You can't work that many hours, do that many things, go, go, go. You're going to have a heart attack and die. And to another person you say, when are you ever going to get off the couch? What is the difference? Why wouldn't everyone strive to be wealthy and happy? I don't know. It's a mystery. So be self-motivated. Don't give that job away to someone else. The guy says, boy, if someone will just come by and turn me on. Hey, what if he doesn't show up? You've got to have a better plan for your life. Since you're self-motivated, and I would assume that you are, and now you're investing your time to gather good ideas for more success, I want to share the best of what I've learned and experienced in my life. You deserve the best I have to give and more. But I will offer you a few major ideas that have really made a difference in my life, financially and otherwise. Mr. Schaub said to me that he thought it was a worthy goal to become financially independent for three major reasons. First, with money no longer a time-consuming consideration, I could then begin devoting heavy time to all the other dimensions of my life. Second, he suggested I become financially independent because it would tremendously increase my ability to help others. Only from positions of strength, including financial strength, can we help someone else. Finally, and most important, he said, I believe it is worthwhile to become financially independent for the sake of developing the person you must become to achieve that goal. What a major secret he taught me. Set a goal to entice you to become the person it takes to achieve it. Reaching the goal is the lesser value. The primary value lies in the person you become by reaching it. You see, it's not the million dollars that's most important. It's what you must do and become in order to be a millionaire. We're all aware that many people feel that we must be careful of focusing on money or affluence or abundance. That in it or in the pursuit of it, there is danger. We often hear quoted from the Bible, the love of money is the root of all evil. And I do agree. If you make money your love, 
and you pursue affluence to the exclusion of or at the expense of other values of life, you have lost, not won. However, let us consider this question. If you could do better, should you? That's not a bad question. In the time allotted to labor, in the time given to economics, care for family, success, achievement, productivity, the creation of value, the development of skills and creativity, if you could do better, should you? I think that one of the greatest satisfactions of living life to the fullest is doing the best you can with whatever you have. Doing less than your best has ways of eroding the psyche. We seem to be creatures of enterprise. Surely it is the reason for the seasons. The soil and the sun and the rain and the seed all say, what can you do with us? The seasons say, do you have the genius to make something unique of us? Life says, here's the raw material. What splendid things can you produce from all there is? So go for high productivity, the full employment of your genius, the full development of your potential in all areas of your life including earning money. That is the essence of life. Truly sophisticated people know it isn't the amount that counts. It's doing all that you can with all you've got that counts. With that background, let me recommend a book for you to read. The title is The Richest Man in Babylon by George Clayson. Perhaps you've already read it. I would suggest that you read it again. It's just a small book. You can read it in one evening. I call it the appetizer for the full discourse on the subject of financial independence. Now, let me give you the major theme of the book. The major theme is that what you do with what you have is more important than what you have. What you do with what you get is more important than what you get. What we do with what we have says so much about us. It reveals our philosophy of life, our attitude, what we know and what we think, and the makeup of our character. It is a reflection of what is going on inside of our head and within our value system and decision-making process. It also reveals our ability to weigh and to perceive. The outer is always a reflection of the inner. It is an indication, a reading, a revealing. It speaks, it tells, it shows. Remember that key phrase I gave you earlier? Everything is symptomatic of something, and it is symptomatic of something right or something wrong. It is a wise policy not to ignore the symptoms, for they can be early signs of a poor choice of philosophy or a sign that something important is being misread, misunderstood, miscalculated. So of all places, take a look here. What you are doing with your money says something about you. Now, what you're doing may be okay. All I'm suggesting is that you take a look. Let me give you some of the details of a good financial plan as suggested by Clayson's book. First, a very broad but important statement. Learn to live on 70% of your net income. Net meaning the money you have left after paying your taxes. Now, after taxes, learn to live on 70%. The reason it's 70 is because you're going to be doing some very special things with the 30%. So what's left, 70%, is yours to spend. Now let's talk about the all-important subject of how you allocate the 30%. I remember one day saying to Mr. Schof, if I had more money, I would have a better plan. He said to me, Mr. Rohn, I would suggest that if you had a better plan, you would have more money. So it's not the amount that counts, it's the plan that counts. It's not what you allocate, it's how you allocate it. Here's the first part of the allocation process. Of the 30% you're not spending, 10% should go to charity, giving back part of what you have taken out to help those who cannot help themselves. I think that's a good percentage. Now you can pick your own percentage, it's your life. And one more thing. The time to start this is when the amounts are small. It's pretty easy to flip a dime out of a dollar, and it's a little more difficult to give away a hundred thousand out of a million. You say, oh, if I had a million, I'd give a hundred thousand. I'm not so sure. 
That's a lot of money. Best we start you early, so you will have the habit before the big money comes your way. Now, here is what to do with the next 10%. Set aside 10% for capital you manage. That is, capital you find ways to utilize. Do some buying and selling yourself. Buy something, fix it, and sell it. Engage in commerce, even if it's only a part-time venture. Your home is a major capital project. In my opinion, we should all engage in capitalism in this country. In our country, we believe the genius to know what to do with capital resides in the populace, the people, the genius to come up with ideas for goods and services brought to the marketplace. It has built a dynamic enterprise known as capitalism and has created opportunities in abundance. And again, remember this thought. The best time to teach capitalism is when a child is old enough to be stimulated by ideas for goods and services. Kids learn the concept of performing services in exchange for capital early, right? They mow the lawn, help in the house, earn an allowance, but take it a step beyond that as soon as possible. They will pick it up fast. Kids ought to have two bicycles, one to ride and one to rent. It doesn't take much to be in business. It doesn't take a million dollars. And the same business principles apply whether it is a bicycle business or General Motors. Show kids how to buy a bottle of soap for $2 and sell it for three. Right in the neighborhood. It's called capitalism in action. Profits, products, and services brought to the marketplace. It is most exciting once you understand the mechanics and the dynamics. It's the stuff of which fortunes are made. You see, the only danger in capitalism is if capital gets in the hands of too few people. As long as it is in the hands of the many, it is a dynamic force for profitable and exciting enterprise. Now here's another thought for your notes. Make sure you turn part of your income into capital. I would suggest 10%. And use that 10% yourself to give your own skill a chance to do something remarkable in the marketplace. No telling what genius lies, unused, waiting for the spark of opportunity. It is part of the path of fortune. Use this thought. Why not work full-time on your job and part-time on your fortune? You can, you know. It's up to you. And you can't believe the feelings every day when you can honestly say, I'm working to become wealthy. I'm not just working to pay my bills. It makes a different kind of day. You will find it hard to go to bed at night and exciting to get out of bed in the morning. Remember, it's the same day, the same opportunity, the same you. But it is a greatly different life working to become wealthy or working to get by. One of the major factors that affects your life, all your life, is what you do with your money. <laughs>